Come on in, come on in, come on in. I want to live on the incline. Anyone want to say man? I want to live on the incline before the Lord. And I want to live on the incline before people in my relationships. And that is for those of you that are married, especially our spouse. I want to live on the incline. All right, we're going to go through the last two and then we're going to switch to this morning's material that we have for you, which we have plenty of notes for as well. And we have a lot of detail, so it'll be on the overhead as we look at it. But we're going to go to number seven. And would you cross off uh, dealing with changing seasons? I'm going to switch on you. So uh, I'm going to switch number seven to relationship orientation. And, it, and, and what we're referring to there when we refer to relationship orientation is, is the view in which you look at life and how you do life. Relationship orientation. Now, it doesn't fit as cleanly, and the last two won't on purpose, but it doesn't fit as cleanly in the incline, recline, and decline, but it does. So I want to suggest to you that God has a purpose for marriage. Anyone want to agree? So um, how many of you come up with a purpose? Tell me what you think the purpose of marriage is. Companionship. Anyone want to agree with her? I sure do. You know, in fact, um, I was th when I was thinking of companionship, I was thinking of just when the Lord saw that Adam was lonely, huh? And so he made a, a helpmate. He made a mate that was suitable for him. And I always say, Lord, make us suitable for one another that we're true companions. Could we even say friends? What's another one? What's that? Complimenting. Tell me more about that. I'd love to hear that. It sounds like a teaching. Um, it's about, like, Krishani has, you know, things that I don't have, which I need. Um. So could I say it's almost like a 1 Corinthians 12 where you as a husband bring in certain elements that your wife doesn't have, and by the way, that she needs. And you as a wife bring in certain elements into the marriage that your husband doesn't have and that he needs. Isn't that right? That's powerful. All right. What's another one? Procreation. So, um, procreation could mean creation. It, it's the making of kids. Is that what procreation is? Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't mean to step on toes, but could it mean, and I realize we have three unmarried people, and we treat anything we're talking about sexually as very sacred. Do you understand? But um, could we also be talking about sexual intimacy? Is that possible? Or is that kind of another one? Huh? How many say, well, that's one worth mentioning, but it's awfully close to it. Okay, I go on Jill's vote. <laughs> and is... In, in other words, sometimes it's just learning to be two becoming one, not just to have kids. But Song of Solomon seems to seem seems to act like having sex is an act of love. It's an act of intimacy. It's not merely, hey, by the way, um, let's get together because we need to have a child. That sounds rather mechanical. But then you read Song of Solomon, there's nothing mechanical about it. It's how about we have love? And could I suggest how about a couple learn, the husband and wife learn to make love. And as a result of that, there might be a few babies that come along. How many of you say that's accurate, Pastor? Huh? It, by the way, it is. 
a friend of mine, I probably have five friends that are medical doctors and most of them have different specialties. It's not because I'm important that they want to be my friend, it's just because I'm old, all right? And the older you get, the more friends you have. Isn't that right? People. One of my friends is a urologist and he's head of the board of urology at the third largest hospital and medical center in Los Angeles. He's also a Eurosurgeon. Now he's not a Christian, he's Jewish, and he's a practicing Jew, and he knows that I'm a strong believer, and he's not offended by me. And quite frankly, I'm not offended by him. Although I, I'll tell him, I don't get it that you haven't figured out who the Messiah is yet. Because <laughs> I know him, and he's real, you know. He just smiles pleasantly. And uh, anyway, but he, he says this. A third of, he, he estimates in the United States of America, in the culture that he deals with. So he's a Los Angeles-based doctor. The, a third of the people that he sees as patients have what he calls disconnected sex. That means they have sex for their own personal solo enjoyment, not love making to their spouse. By the way, God makes sex to be, don't listen to this, you three. No, actually, I think you should hear a Christian talk about it. Listen intently. Don't you agree? I, I'm tired of the world telling our people how to think. And we need the people to know what the Bible has to say. But the difference is learning to connect and love. And God made it to be a whole lot of fun, highly enjoyable. There's actually... There's actually little glands in the brain that neurologists measure, and they say that when a couple is making love, that that gland lights as bright as it can get, saying, hey, there's pleasure there. And we're having pleasure with a person that we're learning to commune with and get along with and love and accept and give and receive. Amen? So... Procreation, let's have some kids, but let's do it with some love involved. Yes? Okay. What's another, what's another purpose of marriage? Let's say it again. Love. Wow. Yeah. In other words, God, you brought my girl into my life to love. And you brought me her for her to love. Isn't that right? Yeah. And what else? I, was, I, I don't mean to turn spiritual on you, but thank you. Look at you. You know what? That's a table of romantics back there. I like that. I just like that. They, you guys, you back in the back are some of my favorites right now, all right? So, so could we add? You know, he said cherish. I like that word. Huh? Huh? Who, what did you say? Yeah, to love, cherish. How about put nourish in there? Can we put nourish? So, so anything else? Uh, 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 we got that, but that's good. Let me add a couple more. Can I add a few? And I want to see if you agree with me. Ecclesiastes 4.4. 4. Two are better than one. If one falls... The other will pick him up, okay? So could I, could I say a home, a couple is a pick-me-up? And I'm going to pick you up. Pick me up, darling. Pick me up. Huh? So it is. It's true. There is something in that. But it, it's a pick-me-up. It is a nourish. And cherish, thank you, by the way. That girl preaches when she says a few words. Anyway, but it's a pick-me-up, not only a nourish and cherish, but there is a spiritual pick-me-up. Listen, if Benita is tripping in life, 
emotionally or in her soul. It's not, girl, what's your problem? Don't you believe God? <laughs> no. Two are better than one. If one falls, here, here, let me help you. How can I help you? You know, by the way, sometimes I want to help her and give her three fixes and to her help is listening. <laughs> huh? Did you catch that? Did you catch that? So we need to learn to listen. And by the way, ask them how best to help them. Yes? So pick them up. How about this? What did you say? Keep them warm. Keep them warm. Yeah, boy. Warm them up. So listen, when you cuddle with your spouse tonight, when you, when you cuddle with your spouse tonight, honey, I am practicing what I'm preaching. I'm keeping you warm, all right? How about this? I don't mean to make it all spiritual, but there is a spiritual aspect that we walk in intimacy together spiritually too. Huh? When two or more are gathered in his name. Ask anything in my name and I'll do it. Okay? So it doesn't say you can only be an agreer when you're in a church facility. You can be anywhere. I'm carrying my agreer. All we have to do is gather in his name and agree together. Do you catch that? Yes. Huh? So... There's a sense of agreement. All right? We're going to learn to agree together spiritually before the Lord. That can be a miracle in itself. Huh? But you learn to agree. Now, how many of you say when you look at that stuff, dude, fulfilling that, we got a good marriage. Huh? How many of you agree? But then there's bill paying that has to be done. So I want to suggest in relationship orientation that there are a couple other things that need to be considered but that can be stealers if you don't watch it and that is there is a there is a strategy of this purpose and to fulfill the strategy we form a structure okay and by the way we could be doing this on your local church you could be meeting with all of your leaders and say, what's the purpose of church? Huh? By the way, the purpose of church is not to keep the carpet clean. That's structure. So people are not going to get excited when you talk about, hey, progress was made last week. We cleaned the carpet. Now it's progress to you because you worked your brains out getting that carpet clean or everybody sacrificed to give their money to it but it's not purpose and if you start getting people excited about structure that's where they're going to put their attention if you get people excited about strategy that's where they're going to put their attention but if you can get them excited about purpose you got them on the right place that's us and the local church that's us and the Lord but we're talking about us and our spouse right now. So with strategy, it's the how we fulfill our purpose. This is the what. This is the how. This is actually, I'll call this the why. What we're about. This is the how. This is the what. So we throw all sorts of things in there that we give our attention to, don't we? I was thinking of, of uh, you know, well, somebody's got to figure out where we're going to live. In fact, do you want to live in a, do you want to live in a house? Do you want to live in an apartment? Do you want to live in a mobile home? Do you want to live in a van down by the river? You know, where do you want to live? Do you want to live? I, I've, I've counseled married couples, you know, and they're getting ready to get married. Where are you going to live? Well, we're just going to live on love and let God put it together. Oh, boy. Neither one of them have jobs. Wonder how far love's going to get them. All right. Now, I don't mean that Henri, but they have to make some decisions and there has to be some life support towards that. Do you agree? Yeah. 
Who will pay the bills? Benita and I have a rule. First person that touches it gets it. All right. Who's going to do the laundry? Do we wear clothes? Will there be a closet to, to put the clothes in? Do we want kids? How are we going to discipline them? How are we going to feed them? <laughs> who, who is going to cook? I don't know, but who's going to wash the dishes? Who's going to wash the clothes after you get the clothes? All right, we're going to have a Bible study. Who's going to do the preparation for that? Who's going to teach? Who's going to get the snacks ready? Who's going to vacuum afterwards? Okay? Now I want to tell you something. I've had couples come in and talk to me. And they were wonderfully in love when they got married. And they give all of their time to this. And they lose love. And they wonder why they've lost love. Because they're not living for purpose. They're living for strategy and structure. When all you talk about is, hey, did you pay the bills today? Um, did you do the dishes? Uh, what do we need at the grocery store? Um, did, uh, do we need to switch the kind of laundry? Do we need to shop and go get? Do we, did somebody put fuel in the car? Did, oh, how are we going to do to pay that insurance bill? Uh, hey, have, what are you doing with regarding school? Uh, are you going to work on your master's so we can make more money and be out of this money pit that we're in because we buy too much strategy and structure stuff? Huh? That's what it is. And pretty soon... You're serving strategy and structure. Your world, if I were to picture it, looks like this. Hey, honey, why don't you go get an education? Because we've been buying so much. You know, we bought more house than we can afford, and we bought more cars than we can afford. We bought newer than we should have. And somewhere, in a very minimal way, purpose is down there. And somebody's got to decide to put purpose back on the throne room. Do you hear me? How many of you have lived some of that out yourself? Benita and I have. You know, yeah. There's two, three, four of us that have. And I didn't see any spouses of the ones that raised their hands. Raise your hands. But thank you. You know, Lord, would you take us from, you know, this would be the incline. But living where all of my investment is into here is living towards the recline and decline. By the way, when I give an offering, because we're in a church, did you bring an offering over with us? Okay, you brought a check. Yeah, I put her on the spot. Do you know who writes our tithe check? She does. Can you tell huh? from what just went on? We, when we give locally, I give for purpose. Lord, I'm giving unto you. I'm giving into your kingdom. You want me to trust you. I'm trusting you with my finances. I, I don't want to give. I mean, by the way, I'm glad for the church to get carpet when the carpet stinks. I'm glad for it to be cleaned and it's sure nice to have lights on and pay the electrical bill. Yes. But when people know they're plugging into the kingdom when they're given their tithe and your church talks more about purpose than it does strategy and structure, things are going to happen. Do you hear me? Cry over the unsaved. That's purpose. Cry over the broken. That's purpose. Tell the stories of people getting saved. Tell the stories of people whose lives are being transformed. Talk about your own life being transformed when Jesus is doing a work in you. Because what you're doing is you're talking about purpose then. Do you understand? And it gives life.
How many of you needed to hear that? Or it's good that you did. It's a good reminder. All right. Last one. And that is love. So it doesn't fit as cleanly, but I'm going to make it fit. Number eight. You're on the incline when there's agape love. Agape love is the type of love that John refers to, not only in the book of John, but in 1 John, when he said, we love, 1 John 4, verse 13, we love because he first loved us. So we find then, if you believe that scripture, that your spouse becomes the first humanoid to be the recipient of your response of your love for God. Did you catch that? Your spouse becomes the first human that is the recipient of your response to God of his love for you. So you can tell me, and by the way, this is very strong throughout the book of 1 John, but try reading 1 Corinthians. It'll tell you 1 Corinthians 13 and many other passages. If you're busy, oh, I love you, love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, my God, my strength etc. You know, keep singing it. And then give people the worst time of day. You're not loving. In fact, if I put those scriptures together, I'm walking on thin ice. Help me. Help me not fall in. It would be indicating that I am not loving God because I'm not loving you. Without love, we become a clanging symbol. Do you hear me? I don't want to go around clanging. How am I doing so far? Have I clanged before you? Or do you think there's real love in the guy? There is. And it's <laughs> proven on a regular basis. All right. So agape love is a love not fixed on how you treat me. It's fixed my love for you is fixed on how God treats me. Did you catch that? That's agape love. It's the unconditional love that God has for you and me that he fills us with and then we're able to love others. So if you told me, I have no love for my spouse anymore. Oh, by the way, love is not a feeling. It's an act. It's a covenant. It's a decision. In other words, there's never been a time in 40 years that I have not loved Benita. There's never been a time in 40 years that she has not loved me. Now, have there been a few times she's been challenged in how she feels towards me? Oh, I'm sure. I could probably note a few if I thought for a little while. And probably vice versa. You understand. But we have a commitment, a covenant to love and I will not love. I will not not love her. Does that make sense? I will not not love her because I love God. And because I love God, I love her and vice versa. Okay, you got agape love down? Then in the recline, there would be phileo love. The phileo love is the love of a friend. So these two characters over here have been friends for a long time, all right? And I can tell you're friends with the district youth pastor, too. I can tell he enjoys you, and you enjoy him. I like him, too. He's a great man. You just, you just kind of feel like you're putting your kids in good hands when you send them to camp with a guy like that. Isn't that right? Because he loves the Lord and he's got a little playfulness in him too. He's still young and he's going to harass the kids more than they harass him. All right. Anyway, uh, I have heard when we deal with friendship, I've heard that it said, you won't divorce your friend. So in other words, how about treat your spouse at least like a friend? Huh? How about treat him like your best friend? Because we, we won't talk to our friends in a certain way. I mean, do you go around scolding your friends? Huh? You talk down to your friends? I don't. They just smack me upside the head and talk back to me. Like, what is wrong with you? That's how friends talk. I mean, is it how your friends talk to you? 
Huh? I mean, they wouldn't. I have friends that equally love the Lord. One of them's down the street. I mean, he, I miss him. I thought of writing him and sending him pictures of you guys because he's, he's one of my prayer partners. He's praying for us every day. He told me, Robbie, if I wake up during the night, which is England Day, he said, I'll be sensitive as to how to pray for the conference while it's going on for those pastors. Now, by the way, when I initially moved there, I didn't have a Christian friend in the neighborhood, and he wasn't a Christian. But within walking with me for a week and a half, he went from pluralism to becoming a Christian, now prophetic, and Benita tells me I'm a better husband because he's in my life. Here's simple things, simple things. We have... In this 110-year-old home we live in, we have carpet that goes up the stairs. It's a red carpet. It's beautiful. It looks very royal. And, yes? Yeah. You know, you've seen it. It's, it's a beautiful home. And my friend, after we walked the five miles, which is mainly a dirt trail, we came back and he was watching me getting ready to walk in the house. He said, do you take your shoes off? No. He said, how long does it take for Benita to vacuum that stairwell mm, that's a big stairwell mm, probably 15 minutes you go in with dirty shoes and walk on that freshly vacuumed stairwell that she just spent 15 minutes of her life cleaning and you don't simply take your shoes off to keep the dirt off of it I do today on <laughs> And he always say, tell Benita hi for me. Huh? She loves him. Huh? Because I treat her different, don't I, Benita? A little more respectful of what she's doing because of the way he respects really everyone in his family. Man's prophetic. We were out. We pray every morning together. These are friends. We pray every morning together on our walk. We stop at a specific place and pray. We alternate what we pray about, etc. One day we were talking about a certain subject, and I went up and we prayed. We stand on this little wall and overlooks the city, and we were praying. We were done. He said, what was that all about? Now, by the way, if you were walking with me, you probably wouldn't say that. He will. He's a friend. I said, what do you mean? He said, it was, dear God, blah, 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 blah. Amen. He said, I didn't hear your heart plugged in. What was going on? I like that. How many of you like friends like that, that will actually love you? It's not hit and run, huh? It's not saying something mean and leaving your church. It's, hey, what's going on in your life? That's a friend. So do we allow our wives or our husbands to speak into our lives? Even as a friend, can we invite them to have a passion about the things that they value and we value. And because of that, if they see something a little off, we actually listen and consider what they have to say without flaring or shoving them away. Huh? Phileo. But researchers tell me that if marriage is just about phileo love, it, it's, it's got a hot spot for about seven years. Then... By the way, this is unlimited. It keeps love alive. Huh? There's one more, Eros. Eros love is, well, it's when you laid eyes on your wife before she was your wife and you thought, hot dog, I'd like her to be my wife. Was that okay to use that hot dog? You know, I'm just, anyway, just, I mean, yow, yowzy. Wahoo. You know, I walked in. Been, I was going for a walk in the morning. I forgot something upstairs. Took me upstairs. And Benita was just getting out of the shower. She wasn't expecting me to walk in. And I walked in and there she was in her birthday suit. Oh, Jesus, I said. Look what God has blessed you with. She smiled. You know what that is? That's Eros love that's been kept alive through agape love. That's been kept alive through also being best friends. 
She knows she's my friend. I know that I'm her friend. She likes me. It's a miracle because I know what she's had to live with. You understand? Eros love. If you only have, isn't she a hottie? They say that there'll be a good spark for about three years. All right. So let's put this in perspective for just a minute. Benita and I get married, and this is time. This is supposed to look like a graft. And this is the level of love. You can't see it hardly over there, can you? Down here is zero, where I don't want to be 50%, 100%. 100% would be agape love. It's the love that God has for us. But I'm pretty proud of myself and think that Benita got a pretty good deal when she married me. And I think that I'm pretty hot stuff. So we get married and I love her with a 70% love. And she likes me and she loves me fairly equal. But she has this time that rolls around about once a month. Dude, I saw attitudes and feelings that I had never seen before. Any of you understand what I'm talking about? Mama forgot to talk to me about that. It seemed like this loving creature suddenly drooped to about a 55 love. Now, being the wise man I am, I sought counsel. So I was working for UPS, made up story. I was working for UPS. And so Frank saw me walk in one morning. He said, hey, how's the two newlyweds? Oh, Frank, we're not doing well the last couple of days. What do you mean? She's, man, I mean, I don't know, maybe... She's got a mental illness or I don't know what's wrong with her. He talks to me a little bit. Ah, oh, Rob, that's what women go through, some of them. Different levels. They'll go through it. But he said, you need to toughen up. Well, what do you mean by toughen up? Don't take that stuff from her. I don't care who she is. I don't care what she's going through. You don't take those attitudes from her. Oh, okay, this is the way it works, right? Toughen up, man. Toughen up. You're just acting untough. Well, how do you toughen up? You show her who's boss. You give her a little bit back of what she's given you. And if that doesn't work, you give her a little bit more. Okay, well, she's been a little bit diminished. So you mean I should just give a little bit less? Yeah, come on, Rob. What, what's wrong with you? Of course that's the way it is. So I go home now that I have Frank's wonderful wisdom and I toughen up she comes in a little bit hey knock that stuff off I tell her what'd you say to me uh, uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, I think I said uh, 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 to knock that stuff off you know so she's getting a little ornery this isn't working too well and she's starting to kind of pull away I go back to Frank thank God the next day happened all right make it back Frank said how'd it work Frank she started blowing up in my face that man you're you're near your breakthrough you're near your breakthrough you got to give her more of it so she knows you've toughened up that you become a stra standard don't don't whip out okay you sure toughen up more he said I'm absolutely sure it's worked with all seven of my wives <laughs> okay okay you're the marriage expert you've been through plenty all right so I toughen up oh Benita did not like that further toughen up man she called her dad and ooh, he was mad at me. Listen, this plane is on an uncontrolled descent. And if I don't bail out now, pull the rip cord. Here's the happy boy. I'm escaping. I don't know how to escape. I'll go to the bar or something and escape. 
Come on, people do it. People in your congregation. And they're getting the same bad advice when they're going to work that Frank was giving me. Come on. Well, there's room for one more graft on here. Let's draw one more and see if agape love works. What do you say? You with me on this? Is this worth your time? This is time. This is love. 50%. 100%. Zero. Well, we get married. Hey, she's getting some pretty good stuff right here. I'm a good man. I think I'm a pretty loving guy. So I love her at 70%. Does that sound like a similar story that I told before? Ooh, about a week, week and a half into our marriage, she went through this cranky time. Rare. Mama didn't tell me about that. Ooh, I thought, what is wrong with that woman? She's loving me, but she's cranky. She's loving me at a 55%. I go to church. Who am I going to pick on? <laughs> I go to church and my friend Sereka is there. He says, how's the two lovebirds? I'm glad you asked. She's been snarly. Robbie, you apparently don't know how to love. What do you mean by that? Robbie, God loves you. And rather than you be snarly back to Benita, you need to give her the love that God gives you consistently. Well, that's going to let her off the hook, buddy. Get her off any hook you have and destroy the hooks, Rob. You need to learn to love. Stop holding on to things. Stop saying there's a limit to it. Are you sure this is going to work? Yeah, hey, me and Krishani work for us. She gets a little snarly once in a while too. Okay. 75%. I think I'm a big guy going up about 6 or 7% of what I was before. Wow, she notices that not only am I stable in my love and consistent in my love, I'm actually growing as a man. That provides a little security for her. And then I can actually say, hey, by the way, I know you're going through a time. By the way, do you know why God trusts women with hormonal changes every month? Do you know why? You need to hear this. And also, <laughs> hang on. Hang on. And do you know why he trusts you? Well, then you go through, I don't know, 50 years old, you go through a, a punch of a hormone change or whatever you want to call it because you're stronger than men. He knew men couldn't take that. He, we needed the consistency. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Do you hear me? Hear me honor you. How many of you ladies feel a little honored by that? Okay, thank you. Three of you, four of you raised your hand. I'm in hot water again. I'm in hot water again. So I love her. She feels more stability in her love for me. I go back and say the next Sunday, Shereka, it worked. Robbie, it works because God is present. You're making, it's not just two Christians. You're making him Lord of your marriage and Lord of your heart. Okay, all right, I'm going to continue then. I'm going to keep loving a little bit more. Now, this plane seems a lot safer to fly than the other one does, doesn't it? Okay, area before you in Christ where you've fallen in some sort of recline of life or decline, I want you to deal with it this morning. For the rest of you who are married, if you're an aware of an ant you're you're with them for the rest of you if you're area aware of maybe it's not even an area we talked about but you're thinking hey we were on the incline at one time but I have allowed in my own heart to be on the recline or decline and I need to be different then I want you 
to deal with that right now. Here's what I'm going to ask. Would you, lady with lady, man with man, get together in groups of two or three? And I only want you to take five, six minutes, which for you will mean ten. Would you pray with one another? Just say, just very quickly, this is an area. And maybe you would trust them with a little brief of that area. And then all two or three of you share, and then pray for one another. <coughs> would you do that? Okay. Take that break, and then we're going to resume right here. So go ahead now. 